You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a new podcast series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, data-driven look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business executives. To make sense of these topics and how they'll unfold, we'll sit down with thought leaders and do what we do best at the Conference Board, provide insights for what's ahead. And I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board, the host of this podcast series. Today's conversation will focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, or or DEI as it's called, in the workplace. As our culture evolves, demographics change, and global competition intensifies, why is the focus of DEI more important than ever for businesses? What should companies do when evaluating programs? How do they make sure that they make meaningful change? And all of those questions. And we're very pleased to have join us today Dr. Laura Sabatini, who is the principal researcher and expert in our Human Capital Center at the Conference Board focusing on DEI. Laura, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. Great to be here. Okay, so Laura, earlier in my career, we started talking about diversity. Mm -hmm. And then somewhere along the way, we started talking about diversity and inclusion, or what we call D and and I. Yes. Now we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is DEI. I can't keep track of the alphabet soup. Help me with this. So talk talk about how it's evolved. And there's going to be even more words probably coming up. Oh, no, we can't make any more change. (laughs) Yes. So, well, let me define, maybe it would be helpful to just define uh, what DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion, as you already mentioned, is in the workplace. And I just want to be very concrete because I think the same terminology can have very different meanings, like if you go to education or public policy. So in work and organizations, DEI comprises all those policies, programs, practices, that help organization ensure they have a representation of talent, as you already mentioned, across uh, work, and that the talent can also fully participate. So the ultimate goal of DNI, regardless of what you call it, what you call it diversity and inclusion or diversity, equity and inclusion, is to help organizations be more effective in ensuring that everybody at work can help them. Now, if you look at the specific terminology, I think, for example, equity has always been sort of part of the conversation, but now has been brought to the forefront. So diversity refers to all those uh, dimensions of diversity that we often think about when we consider diversity, equity, and inclusion. So demographics and uh, gender, race, ethnicity, uh, age, disability, LGBTQ status, but it also includes other dimensions, right? So most of us have more than one dimension of, of, of identities. And so anything that we all bring to the organization, such as our way of learning, our way of thinking, our educational background, our social class comprise diversity. Equity, what equity does, it helps ensure that our processes and practices are fair towards different groups. So how we hire, how we promote, how we pay our workers, Equity helps organization examine how things are done and how they have evolved as the workforce and talent evolves. So maybe old ways of doing things, or maybe the old ways we hired does not take in consideration new buckets of talent that are now available. So that's an example. And last, you know, and I want to get to to spend too much time on definitions, but I I think it's important for a context. Inclusion is more about the culture. So if you have a very diverse workplace, you want to ensure that everybody can contribute to their work. And and so inclusion has to do with culture in an organization, culture in a team, and ensuring that people can speak up, can bring their talent in. And, and I'll give a kind of a practical example. You know, if you have a team where maybe half of the team feels like they have proactively hide part of themselves because maybe they don't feel fully accepted, that's going to create a burden and you're not necessarily going to have a very effective team. 
So, so diversity, let me pause. equity, and yes. inclusion. You want you want a diverse group of people, you know, with all sorts of different characteristics. Yes. You want equality of opportunity, equity, exactly. and treatment across the workforce, and then inclusion, exactly. which is how you how people engage with each exactly. other and part of the culture. And so all of that refers to the workforce, right? Yes. So does DEI then extend to other stakeholders? Uh, potentially, definitely, you can, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. So if you're in, in certain fields, external stakeholders, for example, many, many companies and many of our member organizations are well, they may be partnering with universities in terms of getting talent, entry level talent interns and so on. And so these approaches can also inform how organizations interact with uh, educational institutions or, or other organizations. For example, you know, I know many tech companies that are trying to diversify their talent will work with university to encourage, uh, you know, people that are underrepresented, for example, an engineer to to follow those fields. Another but you example, know, diver but, but yeah. it also goes, it goes to customers, exactly. doesn't it? It goes to the exactly. other stakeholders, customers, exactly. owners, and so, yeah. So, yes. so it really, it's it's really Around. everybody yeah it everybody is. a company is. engages with exactly. isn't it exactly exactly yeah. it does and it, but it's not easy right so yeah. uh, and that's kind of the challenges that we're seeing for sure so you 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 run the 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 institute here at uh, in, yeah. in our human capital center for DEI and we have we have member companies that are way down the road on this they've been talking yes. about this for a long time in 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 my own experience for forty years. We've been yep. working on these issues. So none of this is new. But then you have other companies, other members where yes. it's brand new for them or they haven't even started on this thing. So there's exactly. a really big range out there. Huge range, huge range. And and it's, you know, the good news is that it's getting increased visibility, right? So more and more companies are sort of trying to figure out, okay, what can we do? How, where do we start? And we get, you know, those questions. But it's huge range, both in the US and also abroad. So historically, the US was one of the first countries to start implementing DNI, especially during the 60s with the civil rights and anti-discrimination legislation coming into place. And so in a way, many US companies have started uh, these trends. But uh, as you pointed out, and uh, not all companies, and some have been doing this since the 60s and others have not. And, and also there's a global variation. So I started to do this work in the late 90s and and back then you know many regions like in Europe uh, were not even didn't even know what diversity was and now you're starting to see more and more companies expand into uh, the regions outside the US global companies. Yeah and, and and ironically your work started in Italy which is exactly. you know, which is where you're from and and, exactly. and, you, and yeah and we're taking it around the world. But you know the the history here so a lot of people think oh this DEI stuff is brand new but it you know it's been going it's on not. a long time hasn't it? It's not. It has. And and I would say maybe to reframe it we'll say that specific elements of DNI have been going on for a long time. But the field has evolved so much, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's with and and in the ways, you know, it has followed changes in the labor market, historical changes, political changes. You know, I, I'm thinking just about, for example, women's uh, workforce participation and how that has driven many DNI policies related to gender and inclusion, and many of the even types of programs that organizations put in place now to encourage increased representation of women into senior leadership roles, for example. So um, it has evolved. It's becoming more complex it's becoming more integrated and i you know i like to say that maybe it's getting better and it's and it's improving in terms of finding the right approach to really uh, be effective uh, in many ways and, and and you know people may not realize but the conference board was founded in 1916 yes. when a group of business associations came together and helped to develop the 40 hour, five day work week, which is all around, you know, equity and inclusion. Yeah. They talked about uh, and, and de determined and agreed upon standards for workplace safety and how working yes. women were going to be treated. We then, you know, we followed up in the 40s with uh, employment of people yeah. with disabilities, people, uh, veterans coming back. And obviously in throughout the, the 60s and 70s and all of that. So this has been core to our work. Mm -hmm. And uh, and major companies work for a long, long time, over 100 years at least. Yes, 
Yes, definitely. And, and and as you pointed out, you know, these were topics that were relevant then. And, and you know, I'm thinking the research on working women done right after World War One. you know, kind of when a lot of times the workforce, you know, changes, changed during uh, major wars when when men were in the field. So, yes, all these processes. And I think that uh, exactly looking at the history of the conference board, you can tell that elements were still there. It was not called DI, you know, and and in fact, you know, if you look at when the terminology started, uh, it's more around the 80s when uh, we started to realize, especially in the U.S., that, wait, the workforce, the talent pool is changing considerably and it's going to change even more. So that's when people and organizations start to say, oh, wait, we want to get ahead of this now. Yeah. And it was in the 80s that, you know, in my own experience, we talked about certainly our employees, but we also talked about suppliers and and trying to diversify our suppliers to minority and women owned businesses, smaller businesses and so forth. And that's all part of the DEI effort, too. So this has been going on a long time. You talk about the history Mm -hmm. and and so forth. So it's a journey that companies have been on. And I think you, you talked about you know, uh, companies being at different places, some being, you know, pretty yeah. far along others. But so, so describe the journey. Where are we on the journey? And some people say, well, in the baseball game, where are we? What inning are we? Yes. But what, you know, where are we on this journey? It's not the beginning and it's certainly not the end. Yes, it, it's not. And, and, you know, I don't know if I can see I can define or see the end. So it's difficult to say where we are, as you say. But I'll say one thing that, the events of the past year have completely accelerated whatever trend was happening in DNI. And, and I'm sure you know you've noticed, I definitely have in my work here the amounts of questions that come from our member companies on this topic uh, across businesses, not only from DI or talent, but from a lot of different types of industries are really a lot more. And, and I think uh, what happens is that why the field had been uh, interesting, the field had already been increased. So if you look at trends over time, you read, you know, starting the 2010, 2015, you see a lot more interest. So if you'd asked me this question, you know, early 2020, January 2020, I would have said, oh, yes, there's a lot more interest. Uh, there's a lot of more organizations taking their initiatives global. We've done some research on that. But, you know, with 2020, there's all these intersecting events and things that happen that have put DNI really at a turning point. And so on a one point, we have the pandemic, and I know you've talked about this uh, before on this podcast and how it's impacting the way we work, the way we lead in m- 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 many ways. And organizations started to see in, that uh, it was impacting different workers differently, right? So parents of young children, for example, or uh, people uh, living in urban communities where at the beginning the virus was impacting them uh, to a larger extent and frontline workers. So that their interest. Then there's social unrest and, and protests against racism and, and organizations starting to try to figure out, okay, how do we talk about this? What do we do? How do we? And so all these events have really put the eye on the radar and now companies are hiring more are thinking about this a lot more and if i can share one quick thing of a report that is coming up so this is a preview of that uh, that uh, uh, we did an analysis of the labor market data to see to what extent companies are hiring roles that are dedicated to DNI specifically so DNI leaders DNI managers you know think people that that's all they do within organization and the increase started in 2015 so it's been increasing consistently but now um it has you know it's increased by a very larger amount starting in 2019 so what we found in our study is a big jump starting 2019 2020 and an increase 36 percent number of jobs that were posted related to DNI. So this tells us that there's a lot of investment in DNI through time, uh, staff, and you know resources. This was during a time when many companies were freezing hiring, and yet they decided to, you know, accelerate their hiring of DNI leaders. We're talking with Dr. Laura Sabatini, the leader of the. Uh, DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Institute at the Conference Board. And we talked about the history of initiatives and the trends that we're seeing. Next, we're going to talk about what businesses can do to successfully implement DEI and capitalize on the opportunities and also steer clear of common pitfalls. We're going to take a short break and be right back. 
Interested in this content? You can find this and much more at our conference board website, www.conference-board.org. Or even better, contact our membership team and your company can enjoy the benefits of our in-depth research around the economy, environmental, social, and governance issues, public policy, marketing and communications, and human capital. As a member of the conference board, you will be able to have full access to all of our cutting edge research, leading indicators, benchmarking and data services, in addition to webcasts and podcasts such as the one you are enjoying now. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the conference board, and I'm joined today by the leader of our DEI Institute at the conference board, Dr. Laura Sabatini. Laura, I have to ask you a question. You know, you mentioned earlier in the first part uh, that the U.S. was a little bit ahead of this thing. And I wonder if that's just because of the way that the U.S. is composed. You know, we have the, a pluribus unum, another out of many, one, we, we, you know, we are a country of immigrants, people coming from all over the world. And, and that's different. I mean, you're coming from Europe. That's different than a lot of European countries where people look more similar and don't have the same levels of diversity. Yeah. Yes, definitely. I, 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 I agree that that's probably behind the history. And now, though, we are seeing similar trends in in other countries as well. Uh, right. So but you're right that oftentimes when you think of global DNI, a lot of the focus uh, remains on gender. But I would say that now with new migration and 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 uh, trends in Europe, as well as in parts of Asia, other elements of diversity are also being of interest to many organizations. So if you could describe the, you know, what Nirvana looks like and, and uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. bro broadly in, in DEI, what, so when you're talking to, uh, you know, great DEI companies, mm -hmm. or, you know, what does it look, I mean, what, how does it feel? What does it look like? How do employees experience that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's, it's difficult. So I'm, I'm trying to think about how, you know, we can define Nirvana. I definitely don't think that Nirvana has to do with one particular goal, right? You know, so let's say the company says, okay, we want to achieve 50-50 representation at, at the senior leadership uh, roles in our companies. That's really great. And that's going to help. But the reality is that as we've seen this past year, there's going to be other challenges and things coming up. It's not about one individual goal and one group being represented more than others. Maybe if I can keep this um, sort of maybe it will sound a little general, but to me, uh, Nirvana in DNI, it's probably when DNI can happen sort of without a lot of effort. I think right now many companies are doing this and putting a lot of work resources, changing, switching, and so on. And so there will be a time, I hope, when it just becomes part of the way the business is done, the part we hire, we promote, you know, where these considerations get integrated and updated as they go. And so you're still going to have to do the work. I don't think we're ever going to get a point where, oh, that's that's it. The same, you know, that we don't ever get achieved like the perfect level of engagement or, or business. Uh, but um, but I think that that will really improve and help uh, companies do this uh, more effectively. But Laura, is it, you know, sort of, how do you think about this chicken or the egg? I mean, you know, yep. to some extent, you, you, you talked about, you know, the social strains over the past year or two here in the U.S., does it require that all of that kind of sort of work its way through society before we can do it in business? Or can businesses be the leader of this and create these microcosms of, you know, of, of social fairness yes. and, and equity and inclusion that maybe yes. then will enhance and, and influence the rest of society? Exactly. And and I think you have a point, you know, and I know that we've talked about this with many leaders and CEOs, uh, you know, here at the conference board. And I agree. I think that in a way, this is an opportunity for large companies and global companies to drive some of the change. And, you know, and some of the companies that are doing this and been doing this for a while have actually been instrumental in even driving policies related to uh, work in different regions, like related to women's participation, to parental leave, and so on. So companies really are at the forefront of really impacting what's happening within their communities. And within uh, some groups of companies, you know, those that also have, uh, for example, manufacturing stakeholders in different regions, there's also the opportunity to benefit the communities where they work and, and in a way influence equity and, and inclusion in, in those communities as well. So, you know, I, sometimes, you know, it, it's helpful to kind of try to simp oversimplify something. Yes. And I know DEI experts will probably get 
you know, will think this is too juvenile, but, but isn't it just about, you know, training people that this is how we want everybody to behave and then tracking it and making sure that the numbers then, you know, are reflective. I mean, at its core, isn't it just, you determine that you're going to do it and we're going to behave this and then training people is, you know, I, I know that there are nuances, but is that really a good way to think about the core of it? You know, it's, it's a good way of thinking about, you know, working within culture. But the reality is that if you just put this on, you know, saying, okay, people, we all want you to behave in a certain way, you know, we know there's different culture. I think it has to be a tied to uh, the way we do work. Otherwise, we're all going to fall in all patterns, right? We know from psychology, and my psychologist by training, that, you know, we're not going to put necessarily a lot of extra effort in doing something. We are more likely to feel closer to people that are similar to us. You know, we have all these biases that are completely unintentional, but can in the way of our making decisions. And so ideally, you know, you want to get to a point where it's so ingrained in the culture that that's all you need. But right now, we do need effort and skills for leaders and, and workers to sort of realize what the barriers and experiences may be of other people and, and, and sort of know how to do something about it, how to help. And most importantly, though, I'll, I'll go back and, you know, it's important to let people know why it's important for the organization. You know, we don't go to work, you know, well, we're a nonprofit and we are a think tank. So we go to work to, to make, you know, a better world. You're, you're talking about us at the, at, at the- you know, yeah, you're talking about us exactly. at the conference board. Yeah, but exactly. It, but, but but most people go to make money. You know, they go to the yeah, business yeah, yeah. and they want to do their work. They and yeah. and so so make tie what you're doing. Explain why it's important for everyone and and how we can make your work and your business more sustainable and more effective. And I think that will really lead people to understand and and participate a little better. So go you know, to, to talk about the measuring uh, piece yes. of it because you know you, you you get what you measure and and it's important that you do track this. What you know what are the best practices in measurement and tracking? Yes, yeah. So this is a, a growing area. So it's a great question because it's something that is really uh, is one of the topics that came up as top among many DNI leaders and and organizations. Uh, okay, how do we track better? So. Uh, to this date, many organizations still only track their numbers in terms of representation. So, okay, we want to achieve this goal. Let's see how we're doing. And to be clear, representation is important. You definitely need to track that. But sometimes it doesn't give you all the information you need to understand if what you're doing is effective and, and to understand how to improve even. So, uh, the best practice in terms of representation, for example, first of all, don't look only at representation. So that would be the first rule. Make sure that you consider other metrics. Many organizations already track these. So it's just a question of, of not keeping those siloed. So for example, turnover, retention, who stays at the company, who gets promoted and so on. If you have engagement surveys, all those data are really important. If you have inclusion indices that more and more companies are now integrating in their measurements, that's a great. So compare, look at representation, but also look at how employees are, are, are sort of experiencing the workplace, looking at others. And the second element of doing this uh, more effectively is also to break down the data in a meaningful way for your company. So don't look at average, okay, uh, across a whole, let's say, across all VP levels, uh, where are people? That's a good piece of information, but sometimes it can be helpful to divide this up by function, business, and I'll give you an example. I actually worked with a company a number of years ago that they found that there was one business specifically, their sales team, believe it or not, that was doing really well in terms of you know recruiting, hiring, and retaining diverse groups. And, and so they said, okay, this is a bright spot in our organization. Let's see what they're doing and see if we can sort of look. But if I hadn't divided up the data to sort of look at those trends, you might not get that information. And the very last piece is assess your initiatives. Organizations we know from actually work that we just did this year on the ROI of inclusion, our invest companies are investing a lot of money on, on these uh, big initiatives, and they're not always evaluating whether these are effective. Uh, so, you know, consider there's a lot of resources there to do so. The good news is that you don't have to evaluate 
every single activity you have in DNI. Just pick the ones that make the most sense strategically to look, those that have more visibility, more people, more resources, those that are especially visible you know, to your stakeholders, and, and consider evaluating those to make sure that uh, they're on the right track. Yeah, you know, and, and you've got some people saying that, uh, and, and there there are data out there that show a correlation, and I'm not mm -hmm. sure about the causality, but a correlation that some of the most diverse organizations are the best performing organizations. Other people say, well, that's because the best performing organizations can afford <laughs> to, yeah. you know, to focus on this um, in, in addition to their core business. What say you? Yeah, it's, you know, there has been, as you mentioned, there's been a lot of research out there, you know, about the benefit of diversity. I'm sort of thinking, and 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 not everybody thinks that, that we're sort of beyond that uh, issue because to me, it's about where the talent is, right? So we know talent is diverse. The diversity is already out there. We see the trends in the marketplace. We see expectations from from external stakeholders and shareholders about diversity data and having those representations. So to me, it's not as much about whether diversity benefits organizations, and there's a lot of research and, and where it what comes first, but about making sure that if you have a diverse organization, that it's effective and everybody is contributed to the fullest so that you are using your talent in a way that is actually benefiting the organization. So it's not the what is the how in my perspective. Yeah, and you know this this goes back to the multi-stakeholder approach because if yeah. if your if your owners are diverse and if your customers are diverse, exactly. then and, and your 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 people you know inside the company are not, then you're certainly not going to produce the kinds of products and services, that, yep. or communicate uh, with your customers in the best fashion. So, we as a society in the United States are becoming more and more and more diverse, and and, and you know yes. there's a lot of talk about becoming a majority minority country in relatively short time. So in order to deal with that effectively and compete most effectively, yep. you need that level of diversity exactly. within within the company in order to position the company well. Is that is that a yes, good way to think about it? but it has to work within, the, you know, so as I mentioned at the very beginning, it's not just about diversity. Is it, it's great because it's going to change the way things are, but also make sure that everybody feels like they're they're contribute and is getting sort of opportunity. Yeah. So you're getting basically a way to ensure that you're getting the best talent at every level. And uh, but yes, it's diversity in many situations is sort of a fact of our world right now. So what can we do? Maybe let's move about what beyond, you know, is diversity good for business? There's a lot of research already showing okay, how can diver maybe it's a question of how can diversity be good for business? So wrapping up then Last question, if you could wave your magic wand and you could get all the companies to do what you think is the right thing to do in DEI, what, what steps would you have them take? Yes, so um, this is a summary of th things that we've already discussed, right? So let me say, the first one, yeah, look beyond representation and beyond hiring. Those are great metrics to consider, but you wanna make sure that those who you hire are staying in organizations and they're contributing and representation alone doesn't give you the picture of what's happening. Measure effectiveness of DNI programs, uh, especially when you're investing time and, and money and, and you have uh, very ambitious goals. Uh, make sure that you see if things are working and if not, adjust accordingly. And one thing that we haven't had the chance to cover as much here, but it's make sure that it's not only diverse or underrepresented groups that are participating in diversity, equity, and inclusion provide the right communication uh, so that everybody can contribute to this. And this doesn't have to do necessarily with participating in programs. It can be just giving people the tools to understand why this is important and what you can do as an individual to that. So how you hire the networks and so on. So expand DNI, don't make it just about a few groups make it about everyone. And last, and I'm sorry to say this, but I would say, you know, uh, don't expect results to happen overnight <laughs> or to, uh, the reality is that, as you mentioned, Steve, there has been companies doing this for many, many years. It takes time, it's, it evolves, and it's a very complex issue to So consider identifying complex solutions to a complex issue. Laura, thanks so much for joining us today and providing our listeners with your thinking on DEI. Thank you. We've been uh, joined today by Dr. Laura Sabatini, the uh, leader of the 
DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Institute at the Conference Board. And thanks to all of you for listening to CEO Perspectives. Every few weeks, I'll be joined by a leader from one of our centers or our member companies to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover all the leading topics in public policy, environmental, social governance, marketing communications, the economy, and of course, human capital. Please share CEO Perspectives with your colleagues. I know that they want to listen too. I'm Steve Odlin, and this podcast has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You have been listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board.